let's, let's go to our scriptures, and I want to read it just first this morning before we uh, introduce the subject matter and get into our thoughts. We're in Hebrews chapter 11, and I invite you to begin reading with me in verse 8 as we continue to drill down on the consequences of faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out of the place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to a city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born descendants, as many as the stars of heaven, and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These all died in faith. Not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged them, or rather acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. And I read a few extra verses for you there. That's okay, right? You get those for free. Our writer takes us on a journey. This time, we're not going back to the time before the flood, as we did with Abel and Enoch and Noah, we're going back to the patriarchs, the, the foundations for the people of Israel. And we are reintroduced to them, uh, as it were, and, and offered up these summary statements that begin in verse 13 concerning their faith, because they, like everybody else we've talked about so far, are, serve as object lessons concerning the consequences of faith. This is what faith looks like. And in particular, we are starting to understand and wrap our minds around what faith that endures looks like, because that's the point. We are talking about perseverance in the faith. That is the goal. It's not just starting with a flourish, it's finishing in the faith. And so we're starting to realize what that looks like here. Verse 13 says, these all died in faith, not having received the things promised. But having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. And so let's, let's park there for just a second and let's introduce this, this consequence of faith. Because talking about the patriarchs, in particular today our time will concern Abraham and Sarah. But they saw what God had promised. God made particular and specific promises that were to them, but not just for them, they were for the nations of the world. Through Abraham, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And God made specific promises to them. And by faith, Abraham saw what God promised. They knew because of the promise of God. And because they believed God, they knew that this world was not their home. And so they embraced by faith what God had promised, even though they didn't receive it. Now, we need to chew on that one for a while. That they trusted in God to give them something that they saw by faith, but that they never received in this life. And so, in other words, their faith required them to wait. 
It, this wasn't just an exercise in patience, like you're twiddling your thumbs, waiting for the doctor to call you back and, and to be seen. We're talking about a lifelong, decades-long journey that required them to wait. And their waiting shows us what the essence of faith looks like. This is the, another consequence of real, genuine, persevering faith. It waits. Before we dig into the scriptures and talk more about their faith, I think it will help us to have an honest conversation about, about who they were, these patriarchs, in particular, Abraham and Sarah, because they were real people. And sometimes when we read through the scriptures, we have so sanitized this, and, and that has many sources, I think, but we have so sanitized this that we lose fact, sight of the fact that these were real people. And they were living in the real world, and they had real faith in a real world, and they had to, times being different, culture being different, they had to deal with the same problems that you and I have to deal with. They, they experienced highs and lows, good and bad, death and loss, life itself. All of those things they experienced, and they did so with faith. And they endured through life with faith. That said... They were not perfect. I don't know if you read through Genesis lately, but Abraham called the father of faith by Paul in the New Testament was not a perfect man. And, and, and oftentimes we lose sight of that too. And, and by the way, he made his fair share of mistakes. So did Sarah, so did the other patriarchs. Some of the things that they did were actually quite scandalous. And that if they were to transpire in our day, might land them in a heap of trouble. They were, they, the point being, they were sinners and that they needed grace, right? When we call these people saints, we're not putting them on a pedestal and, and, and exalting them as some kind of superhuman example of faith. They were real people who struggled with real issues and had real problems just like you and me. And by the way, when we say that, that means that their faith wasn't perfect either. Their faith was imperfect, and, and that's really the point, I think. Sometimes small, sometimes almost imperceptible, they had faith. And that reminds us of what the standard is here. Because the standard for our faith is not its size. We, we sometimes, in our effort to inspire people and, and build enthusiasm, we talk about big faith and big dreams, but that's not the point Size is not the standard. Neither is the sincerity of it. That's, when you read through the lives of these patriarchs, that, that they lived in such a way sometimes that their faith is all, you can't even hardly see it. But yet with New Testament perspective, we're able to look back and they had it. The standard for our faith is not perfection. It is not that you never make a mistake that you never have any doubts, that you never have any questions, that is never the standard. Faith concerns an object. And that object is the person, the Lord Jesus Christ, about whom our writer of Hebrews has had much to say. Amen? I mean, it's taken us 10 chapters to get to this place. Jesus has a name above all. He is superior to everyone and everything to which he has been compared. And so the object of our faith is what is the standard, not us or how we feel. Small faith, Jesus said, even faith the size of a mustard seed can move mountains because of the one in whom we believe. Size is irrelevant. It's who we believe in that is important. Amen? A couple weeks ago, uh, it's two weeks ago now, my timing's a little off, the Dr. Tim Keller passed away, and I don't know if you're familiar with him, tremendous theologian, one of the best in this modern era, I believe, and he, and he has a quote from one of his sermons, Anchored in Christ, that, that I'm reminded of here and that I think will help you understand the standard of our faith before we go any further. He said this, and I quote, if you are falling off a cliff, strong faith in a weak branch is fatally inferior to weak faith in a strong branch. 
Can I, I'm gonna repeat that. If you're falling off a cliff, strong faith in a weak branch is fatally inferior to a weak faith in a strong branch. He went on to explain salvation is not finally based on the strength of your faith, but the object of your faith. It is Jesus who saves you by faith. It is not your faith that saves you. It is Jesus who saves you by faith. Amen? And so it's safe to say when we go back and we look at the patriarchs, just based upon that, they had weak faith in a strong branch. Okay? And in addition, then, we can say, talking about them, that waiting doesn't mean that they were passive. All this talk about waiting doesn't mean that we sit back or that we sit on our hands and that we idly spend the days waiting for something to come. That is not the example that we see from them and is certainly not what I'm trying to imply when I'm talking about waiting. When you read through Genesis, they searched, they longed for, they were eager, they had great desires and great expectations and sometimes they took matters into their own hands and they made mistakes but sometimes they just put one foot in front of the other and did the next right thing. They longed for what God promised, even though they never received it. And so they were not idle and they were not passive. They were actively believing while they lived their lives. And so we read about them getting married and starting families and farming and shepherding and and, and just living life. We read about them traveling back and forth and all the while simmering under the the, the surface. The undercurrent of all of that is that they took God at his word against all odds and against the world they believed. And so that becomes the point here. That this is supposed to land in our laps and help us live in the real world. Faith that waits helps us live by faith. And that's the point here. And so now as we dedicate our time to Abraham and Sarah, let's talk about him for just a minute before we get into our thoughts. Because Abraham is an important figure in Israel's history, perhaps the most important. They drew much of their identity as a, as a people group from Abraham, and, and much of their identity concerning their religion came from Moses. But, but Abraham may have been the pinnacle figure from their history, because out of his loins, as it were, came the nation of Israel, and and thus becomes perhaps the most strategic example of faith to the Hebrew people that are reading this letter. Remember, these are people with a Jewish background, Jewish history, that that have trusted in Christ as Messiah. And so here, this, this idea that Abraham had to have faith too, very important for them. And he's not just the father of their race, he's the father of their faith. We know that because of what we read in Genesis 15, 6, that he believed God and God counted it to him as righteousness. Paul quotes that in Romans chapter 4 in verse 3. That is so important because we have this doctrine of justification by faith. It's not just a New Testament doctrine. We see that in the character of Of Abraham. He is the father of everyone who believes and therefore is justified by their faith. He featured in our conversation about Melchizedek back in chapter six and seven, where we are told something that we are reminded of here that Abraham patiently waited and obtained the promise. Chapter six and verse 15. And so he and Sarah, his wife, as they occupy our attention this morning from the scriptures, they reveal to us the third consequence of genuine faith. It waits. So now what do they teach us about faith that waits on the Lord? Three things. Number one, faith that waits on the Lord will obey without all the details. Look back with me at the text, verse eight, and and we'll jump down to verses 17 through 19 in just a minute, but we see that from, from two events in Abraham's life where he took God at his word and did what God was asking him to do without a complete understanding, without having all the details, without knowing the end from the beginning, it becomes an example of faith. 
And we see that, number one, look back with me at verse eight from his calling. God came to Abraham and called him out of Ur of the Chaldees, and kind of where modern day Baghdad in Iraq, where Babylon would be in, in, in other Old Testament history. That's, that's the part of the world where they're from. And, and we don't know the exact details about how or when or how often God came to Abraham, but we know that when he did and he called Abraham, Abraham listened and Abraham obeyed. Very important for us to understand concerning this idea of faith that waits. In particular, when you look back with me at the text, that phrase, he was called, we read that in the, in the past tense, but it's, it's really, it really speaks of, uh, of an ongoing kind of action. It should be translated when he was being called. And so here's what that means, that as soon as he understood what God was asking him to do, he started preparing to leave. Meaning that, and as I said, we don't really know how long this took. It could have been days or weeks or months. I guarantee you it wasn't overnight. But by faith, when God revealed his plan to Abraham and God called Abraham, Abraham was already on his way. Abraham believed and obeyed without having all the details. He didn't even know where he was going. You know that, right? That when God came to him and called him to leave his hometown and his family and his country and his business and his friends and everything else that would, his, would have comprised his life, he didn't even know where he was going. God didn't tell him, I want you to leave, Abraham, and I want you to go to a land that when you get there, that, that's when I'm gonna tell you. Wow, what a hard thing that must have been, huh? And he was not given all the details, and those are all the things that you and I want before we wanna make a decision, before we agree to do anything we want to know who's going to be there and what's going to happen and when it's going to end and how much it's going to cost. And you know what I'm saying, right? But that's not how faith works. That's the point that I'm trying to make. Faith will obey God when it doesn't have all the details. And what is more, when we consider Abraham's experience here, he is obeying without any kind of family precedent that his dad wasn't a believer. His dad, according to Joshua 24 and two, was an idolater. And that he lived in an idolatrous part of the world, that he was raised in a pagan home and he grew up in an unbelieving and idolatrous society. And so he had no historical precedent to draw on, no facts. No, this is how this worked out for so-and-so. Maybe if I do what they did, I'll figure it out along the way. Nothing. No details, not present ones, not past ones. But Abraham obeyed. We see that in his calling. We also see it in his offering. Look with me again at verses 17 through 19. This takes us back to Genesis 22, where by faith, Abraham was tested by God. and God asked him to offer his son Isaac as sacrifice to him. And this test would have been the crucible for Abraham. Isaac's a teenager at this point. Abraham was like 100 years old when Isaac was born. You know, and so this, Abraham's at least 115 years old here. And, and, and a lot of water has gone under the bridge here. And, and so God comes to Abraham and asks Abraham to give the son who fulfilled God's promise to him, back to God who gave him. That this is the son of promise. So after all of the wondering and after all of the missteps and after all of the waiting, Isaac is born, but before he's grown up and before he becomes a man and before he inherits Abraham's blessing, God asks for him back. I mean, you can imagine how difficult that was. Or can we? Because God's never asked me for my son. Or has he? I mean, just put yourself in his shoes for a minute. Don't you know he wanted to know why? Well, God, why are you asking me for this? Isaac is the fulfillment of your covenant promise to me. 
that, that you have told me time and time again, in spite of my mistakes, in spite of my missteps, in spite of my, my, my doubts, you have told me that in Isaac, in Isaac shall my seed be named, that it is through him, that, that because he is the fulfillment of that promise. Why, why are you asking me to do this? How? how? Right? How's this going to work, God? And again, in, in the midst of this crucible, Abraham obeys without having answers to those questions. He simply trusts God. And, and to say that faith then, faith that waits and faith that obeys without all the details, I'm not telling you that faith is uninformed. That's not what I'm, I, I'm implying at all. That, that, that somehow we're to just fly by the seat of our pants, that, that living by faith is all spontaneity. That's not at all what is being said here. Abraham didn't know the details. He didn't know the answers to his questions of how and why, but he did know God. And that might be the most important part of all of this for you and me. As a matter of fact, we could say that he knew God so well that he knew it would be impossible for God to go back on his covenant promise. That therefore, that when, he, when all of this transpired, and if you read Genesis 22, you know that they traveled for, for several days to Mount Moriah, and then they camped at the base of the mountain, and then he bound up the wood on Isaac's back, he took the knife in his hand and fire in his other hand, and they began to trudge up to the top of Mount Moriah, and you can imagine the wrestling in his soul and I think Abraham was working it out as he went, one foot in front of another. He believed God. He knew God couldn't go back on his promises. And so if God would ask for Isaac to be sacrificed, then surely God would raise him from the dead in order to keep that covenant. That's what we have from this New Testament perspective. He believed that God was able to resurrect the son of promise if he was to offer him upon the altar. And, and hear me, listen to me. It wasn't Isaac that was on the altar. It was Abraham's heart. It, it, it wasn't, it wasn't the, the lineage of Abraham that was on the line. It was God's name and God's integrity that was on the line. And so Abraham, by faith, offered Isaac. He obeyed without all the details. And so I want you to look at me real quick as we seek some application here. Because if you're waiting like I do sometimes, for God to write it in the sky for you, to answer every question about every detail before you decide to follow, before you decide it's appropriate now for me to take the next step of faith, he will not. And it's not because he's trying to keep something from you. It's not because he, 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 he's, he's not fair. God will not do that because that's not how faith works that we will have to trust him and not the information. That we're gonna have to trust him, not our ability to figure things out because he knows the end from the beginning. And so we are called to walk by faith and not by sight. And so by faith then, we can do what he's calling us to do because we trust him, not because we have everything figured out. And if we wait, hear me, if we wait until we have everything figured out, that's not faith at all. It's not faith in Jesus Christ. That's faith in ourselves. You understand? And so we can, we can even go where he's sending us, where he's calling us. We can give what he's asking us to give. And that's what faith does. And it doesn't matter what he's asking us to do, how severe or how mundane, we can do it all by faith, even without all the details, because that's what faith does. Amen? Secondly, faith that waits on the Lord remains expectant even without the blessing, verses 9 and 10. I think, too, this is fascinating to me, because paradoxically, when, when Abraham obeyed by faith and he took the time to prepare and leave his family and his friends and, and leave behind his former religion and leave behind his business uh, 
that, and, and went out searching for the place that God was sending him, that the blessing did not come immediately. We read through this, especially in, in these verses in chapter 11 here in Hebrews. We read through this and we think these things were happening like that. That he pulled through the drive throw and got what he ordered and moving on to the next thing. That's not how it happened. He is in process here. You understand that? And that, that what began when God called him it meant travel. And, and it would have taken a long time to prepare to leave and then it would have taken even longer to get there. And, and we also understand that, that, that when he got there, based upon how he lived when he got there, that he remained in process. That he, he never received the thing that God promised him. Now, again, we need to chew on this one because it says in the scriptures, verses nine and 10, by faith he went to live in a land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. And so what do we know about Abraham? He lived kind of like a vagabond. That's what is implied by the fact that he was a sojourner and a pilgrim, that he was a stranger there, a foreigner amongst foreign people. And because of that, he wasn't able to build any houses or build any cities. He was never able to put down roots. Instead, he lived in tents. You understand tents are not permanent residences. Even for them, they were not permanent residences. They were for travelers, not people who were putting down roots. And so what is told to us there is that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they all lived together, family tent compound. They were never able to settle down. They never lived in one place for long. And with the exception of the cave that Abraham bought in the field of Ephron to bury Sarah when she died, he never owned any of it. Now, that means what God promised to him as a possession, that God would show him and God told him when he got there, God told him that everywhere his feet would trod, God would give to him and to his descendants as a permanent possession. It was in sight and underfoot, but never in hand. He never owned any of it. The only way that he possessed it was by faith. That was the only way he received it. We should be asking ourselves now then, how he was able to live like that. How could he be so patient? How could he keep going without ever receiving the thing that God promised him? The answer is simple. By faith. And that's the moral of the story. Is that he was able to put one foot in front of the other and keep going and keep trusting because he had faith in God, not a piece of property. That his hope was not attached to that, that piece of land, but his hope was attached to God who promised it. And thus he was looking for a city whose foundations were designed and built by God. His eyes were fixed on God's kingdom, not on a piece of property. By the way, that, that ought to lift our eyes too to, to kind of what we see in Revelation 21 when God says, I'm making all things new. And John, when he's in the spirit, sees a new heavens and a new earth and, and out of heaven descending from the throne of God, a new Jerusalem. And there in that place where God makes all things new, there will be no sorrow and no sin and no weeping, and no dying, for the former things are passed away. Hallelujah. Abraham's hope was attached to the same place our hope is attached. Thousands of years ago, he was looking forward to the same things that you and I are looking forward to, and by faith then, he knew, even if he never took possession of the promised land, he would inherit God's kingdom without fail, because God was faithful. To his promise. Now, loved ones, you know what that means to you and me? That means you may never receive the things that you long for in this life, but that's okay because you get the kingdom. 
Amen? So what if? What if you never get the things that your heart longs for right now, whatever they may be? I mean, you're, you're waiting for them. You've prayed for them. You're longing for them. It's your heart's desire. But, but what if you never get to enjoy them in this life? What if, what if you never get to experience healing while you live on this earth? It's important that we reason these things through. What if, what if you never get to have the quality of life that you want? Whatever that looks like for you, because that's pretty subjective for most of us. Some of us would be happy in a tent in the mountains for the rest of our days, you know? Some of us would be happy with a little space. Some of us would be happy with luxury and ease. But, but hear me, to my point, what if you never get to experience that? What if it never comes? Can I tell you something? Faith that waits remains hopeful, expectant, regardless whether it comes or not. And just like Abraham, our focus is on the king and his kingdom, not in whatever blessings we will have in this life. And so we are longing for that city who has foundations that were built and designed by God. It is that longing, that faith that pleases God and he is not ashamed to be called our God. So without the blessing, faith endures in hope. It remains expectant. God's gonna keep his promises. And, and listen to me. Whether you ever get to enjoy the things that your heart longs for right now, you get the kingdom. That is our expectation and our hope. Amen? And, and whether you ever get the respect or, or the admiration that you long for in this life by faith, if you endure, you will reign with Jesus Christ in his kingdom. Somebody say amen. Amen. These things ought to inspire joy in our hearts because it, it, all of a sudden, these things that will melt and burn with fervent heat, they don't matter anymore. It's not that they're inconsequential. We just don't attach our hope to them. We are not expectant for them. We are longing for the king and we are longing for the kingdom. That's the kind of faith that Abraham had. That is how he was able to wait and never receive the thing that God promised. That's what we're after, loved ones. And so, forgive me for digressing here, but, but if, you, if you look at, at what's happening globally right now, what, what if, what if our, our society never writes itself? What if, what if there is never a revival that comes? What, what if the, the, the economic downturn never turns around? What if everything that we know in this life completely collapses? Where's our hope? Is it fixed to uh, reforming society or, or our politics or, or, or governments? Or is it fixed to the king and his kingdom? because that is an anchor for our souls. Amen? So faith that waits endures even without the blessing. It remains expectant even without the blessing. Now finally, look with me at verses 11 and 12, because faith that waits on the Lord endures without strength too, even without it, in spite of it. We need not forget Sarah here, she was a recipient of this promise too as Abraham's wife. She had a part to play in it too by faith and so we can't leave her out of our conversation because verse 11 concerns her. By faith, Sarah received power to conceive even when she was past the age and that came by faith because she considered God faithful to his promise. So we need to talk about that for a minute. And I know we know the story, but she was 90 years old when she got pregnant. 
Do we have any people who are 90 years old in here? We don't. I know we have some people in their 80s. Can you imagine that? I mean, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm 47 years old and I have a two-year-old and that's hard enough. But we ought to immerse ourselves because again, real people, real life, real issues. And what God promised to Sarah was impossible. Kind of like what he promised to Mary. Impossible. Not only had Sarah been barren for her 90 years, but, but the scripture is pretty clear here that that season was well past. It had passed a long time ago. And so when she first hears this promise in Genesis 18, what does she do? Do you remember Genesis 18, 12? When she overhears the angel promising Abraham that about this time next year you will have a son, what does she do? She laughs. <laughs> and, and, what, and she says in her heart, in her, in, and by the way, that's not a skeptical kind of laugh. That's a, I'm a worn out kind of laugh. Because that's what she says. She says, I'm worn out and Abraham is old. I mean, have you seen my husband? He's old. And she says, how, how will I ever experience this kind of joy? But faith depends on God who does the impossible. And, and, and there's a distinction that we need to make here. Because faith is not belief in the impossible. Faith is trusting in God who does the impossible. And there's a distinct difference Faith, who, faith that, that believes in the impossible, impossible is, is, is no different than, than what any other religious belief offers you. It's no different than the spirit of the age. It's, it's no different than luck or chance. You might as well roll the dice. But faith who depends upon God, who does the impossible, and that, that, that's where we find the blessing here. Amen? Because nothing is too hard for the Lord. That's how the angel responds to Sarah in her laughter. She's got all these questions. I know there's a bird behind me, okay? <laughs> what you don't know is he's been doing that all week and he just wants to get in here and hear some good preaching, okay? <laughs> is anything too hard for the Lord? So at that age, and without the physical ability to do so, she conceives and has a son because God promised. Why? Because with God, all things are possible. Amen? And so Sarah's experience then becomes a joyful demonstration of what faith looks like. Consider what happens because she believes. Because she considers him faithful who promised. Isaac is born. And from Isaac and Rebekah come Jacob and Esau. And out of Jacob come the 12 tribes of Israel. A nation is birthed that outnumbers the stars of heaven. That outnumbers the sand on the seashore. And it's not just them that God has in mind here, but it's you and me through the person of Jesus Christ. Because Galatians 3 and 16 tells us that Jesus Christ is the offspring, singular, of Abraham, and that we by faith are heirs with him according to the same promise. That without strength, they believed, and we are blessed because of it. And so I want you to consider with me, as, again, as we try to wrap this up and make some application, the generational impact of your faith. You have no idea what God will do when you take him at his word, when you have no reason to do so according to the world. When you have no reason to put one foot in front of the other because you're tired and you're worn out and you're well past the age, but because you trust God, 
Your family tree has been altered forever. That you have broken generational curses and you have brought generational blessings into your family because of your faith. And so hear me. I want to encourage you. Faith that waits will endure when things don't make sense. When they don't add up on paper, when all seems lost, when, 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 when it seems to you like, like that door has completely shut and you've moved on to something else and, and the time for that, that season is over, when the only outcome seems impossible, faith that waits will endure. That's the point, loved ones. It endures when you're not physically able to put one foot in front of the other. Let this be an encouragement to all of us. When you don't have the strength to keep going, whether it's the same emotional struggles that you have battled since you were a teenager, when that, that, the depression just will not let go and you don't know where to turn, by faith... By faith, you can endure. When you're physically worn out because the healing and the deliverance that you've prayed for has not come, God has said, my grace is sufficient for you and my strength is made perfect in your weakness. So rejoice and be glad. Because in your weakness, his strength is made perfect. Amen? Faith that waits grabs hold of the hope that is set before us with both hands and never lets go, even when you have nothing left. No strength to give, nothing to fall back on. Faith that endures grabs hold with both hands and never lets go. Go. And that, loved ones, is the point. That is the faith that we want. So, be steadfast. Don't quit. Don't move. That you, you grab hold of Christ and, and that, that that anchor will not move. And so you know then, you know that your waiting is not in vain and that everything that you do all of your labor, all of the sacrifice, every effort, because you've grabbed hold, grabbed hold of Jesus Christ, the anchor for your soul, you know that it's not in vain. Your waiting is not in vain. And we know that when we walk by faith. Let's pray together. Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit, We love you and we worship you and we trust you. I pray that you would increase our faith. Lord, help us by faith to wait. And that we would be willing to take you at your word and to trust in who you are and obey without having all of our questions answered, without all the details, we trust you. And so we're gonna do what you ask us to do, no matter what that is. That you would help us to trust you whether or not the blessing ever comes. Because our hope is not in the blessing. It is in you. Lord, increase that kind of faith in us. Give us mustard seed kind of faith in you, not in our circumstances, not in our blessings, but in you. And when we don't have the strength to carry on, when we're worn out and tired and we're wondering if it's worth it, it is. Our waiting is not in vain. So help us to hold on to hope, Father. It is for your glory that we pray in Jesus' name.